Roger Federer isn't competing for his sixth US Open title, but he is still having a major impact on tennis. We'll delve into that, plus what's next for the Pac-12 after it failed to strike a deal with the Mountain West. We're seeing huge early returns on the new era of college football, and this episode is sponsored by Gainbridge. Later, we're hearing from an athlete leveraging a Parity Week grant from Gainbridge to use rugby to make an impact. It's Wednesday, September 4th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we'll hear from Roger Federer's agent and the chairman of the Labor Cup, Tony Godsick, who spoke to our editor-in-chief, Dan Roberts, on how they want to reshape the tennis landscape. Our reporter, Amanda Kristovich, joins to discuss the future of the two-team Pac-12 after it failed to reach a new deal with the Mountain West. We're also speaking with rugby player Chetta Emba on her work to reach girls interested in the sport. And we'll hit the latest in college football, the NFL Sunday ticket case, and the expected betting total on NFL games this year. First, let's hit the headlines. FIFA confirmed that over $6.4 billion, the second most ever, were spent on international transfer fees in the most recent transfer window for men's soccer, with a record-breaking 11,000 players switching hands. Women's football also had a record-breaking transfer window with $6.8 million spent on international transfers, which is the most all-time in women's soccer. The Cleveland Browns have announced a new naming rights deal for their stadium. Cleveland Browns Stadium will henceforth be known as the Huntington Bank Field until 2044. You are that correct, the next 20 seasons. Better yet, even if the team were to move to a new stadium, which they are actively working to do, the agreement is for the existing or new home of the team, so any new field would keep the same moniker. The team is currently fighting to move to Brook Park, a Cleveland suburb. Leon Dreisaitl was awarded with the highest annual contract in NHL history. Dreisaitl and the Edmonton Oilers agreed to an eight-year, $112 million contract with an average annual value of $14 million. This will be the largest salary cap hit in NHL history, but appropriate for a guy who has scored 148 goals in the past three seasons, good for second most in the NHL. His superstar teammate, Connor McDavid, leads the league in points during that span. The WNBA is coming back to Portland. The league is set to add its 15th team in 2026, its third expansion team since last year. The new franchise, which has not yet been named, will likely be awarded to the Batao family, who also purchased the Portland Thorns of the NWSL at the beginning of this year. It's worth noting that Portland already had a WNBA team back in 2000, the Portland Fire, but it only lasted for three seasons, giving it the shortest lifespan in league history. The addition of the new franchise has not been officially approved yet, but Sean Hyken of the Rose Garden Report says that the announcement will come on September 10th. Trent Williams and the San Francisco 49ers agreed on a contract Tuesday morning to end a holdout that began over a month ago and cost Williams $4 million in fines for missed practices and preseason games. The move comes sandwiched between Brandon Ayuk finally agreeing to a new contract and the Niners opener on Monday Night Football against the New York Jets. For that game, it's looking like Williams' job will be a bit easier as Jets linebacker Hassan Reddick continues his contract holdout and is not expected to be on the field. Reddick is now the only player left in the NFL still holding out. Sunday was the deadline to approve a new scheduling deal for the Pac-12 and Mountain West conferences beyond this season, but the conferences were not able to come to an agreement, and now the two schools remaining in the Pac-12 will look to create independent schedules. FOS College Sports reporter Amanda Kristovich joins us to explain why the two sides couldn't work things out and what this means for the murky future of a conference struggling to hold on. Joining me now is Front Office Sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome back, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Great. Great to have you on. So the Pac-12 and the Mountain West have a deal for this season that has them working together on scheduling. Seemed to make sense for both sides, but it's not going to be renewed. So uh, first of all, feel free to fill in any details on this deal that they have, but also why is this not going to continue? I mean, look, I I think the deal was described to me by both commissioners last week as mutually beneficial. Um, the Pac-2, Pac-12, whatever you want to call it, um, sort of gets a, a conference slate of games sort of delivered to them on, quote, a silver platter is what uh, Mountain West Commissioner Gloria Navarez said, um, right? Because if you think about it, if you're an independent, you need to like individually schedule every single game in your season. But if um, you have the scheduling partnership, then you have open slots for non-conference, quote unquote, games. But the majority of your schedule is going to be taken care of. And obviously, the Mountain West um, is not a power conference, but it's, you know, a formidable uh, group of five conference and it's local. So I think it just made sense. And then obviously, the Mountain West gets 
you know, millions of dollars in fees um, out of this, as well as like a little boost in their scheduling as well. Um, the reason it's not going to continue is that first of all, this was only a one year agreement. Um, there was an option to renew, but agreement, uh, the second year of the agreement basically, um, you know, was not like official. It could have been if they had, they had until September one to decide they've chosen not to, um, they basically, uh, you know, had a dispute over the funds and the fees and the amount of money that everybody, you know, <laughs> either <laughs> wanted to give or receive is what the source is that I spoke to explain to you. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, that's, I guess what it always comes down to is we can't agree on the money. Um, it is a little perplexing just because this does seem mutually beneficial. Like the conferences were telling you not too long ago, though that silver platter quote is is perhaps telling because maybe the Mountain West feels like the Pac-2 is getting a lot out of this and they're not getting enough back. And maybe the Pac-2 is saying, well, hey, we're the Pac-12. Like we're we're still sort of a Power 5 conference or we were um, when the Power 5 included us. And so, yeah, is, is it, do you get the sense that just there's there's just a um, disagreement on how much value each side is bringing here? I think that's possible. I, I would also add that, you know, it was an expensive partnership for the PAC-2. Um, I ha need to confirm specifically the numbers. I mean, obviously, I don't have the contract for every single non-conference pay game, but you know, it's on the high end of what a non-contract, a non-conference pay game would be, slash could be even more. So it's it's not like, you know, Pac-2 didn't have a point by saying, hey, this partnership, you know, in our view is really expensive and we'd like to spend, you know, we maybe they would like to continue it, but just wanted to spend some of that money elsewhere. As you said, though, on the Mountain West side, the Mountain West is looking for you know, their own upside, they're looking for the revenue. Uh, that's, you know, the biggest pro for them. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is the Mountain West, regardless of whether or not this partnership continues, already got what they really wanted, which was that embedded in the agreement um, was a stipulation that there are even more exorbitant, um, you know, fees if a PAC, if the PAC-12 tries to poach a Mountain West school for two years after the agreement ends. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I'm talking like $10 million a school, right? Um, there's like sort of an escalator sliding scale in, in the agreement. And the only way that they wouldn't have to pay those fees is if there was a reverse merger where the PAC-2 invited every single Mountain West school. So the stability and then the extra revenue is really what got um, you know, the Mountain West into this side of the deal. And the stability is not going away because they're still going to have two years. And, you know, the PAC-2 only has a two-year grace period total uh, to rebuild their conference starting this year. So, do you see them? You, we're doing yeah, the math right. here, right? So yeah, it's so it's not years. like, oh, two years, they're just going to poach all those schools. Right. It's like two years, they're, they're the not going to be a conference. They if won't they exist, can't, can't, precisely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> precisely. And so, yeah, just... Lastly, what does the PAC-12 to do here? Do they try to get up to eight schools? Do Oregon State and Washington State just say, we're going independent, we'll figure it out from there? Something else, is there a likely path here? I mean, they're looking at all, you know several different options, and I think this still rings true, even though Commissioner Teresa Gould told me this last week before the partnership, um, you know, September 1 date passed, um, is that the conference is looking at, you know, at least for next season, considering, you know, scheduling as independents. They're, you know, clearly they, they have, they both, both of the schools have several games scheduled. They're considering scheduling more. I mean, the fact that she said that to me on the record suggests that the schools have interest from other power conferences, more strength of schedule, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, they clearly have other options. I don't think they would have, you know, gone to the negotiating table and instead of just renewing because they had no better option trying to negotiate for a lower rate if they didn't have something up their sleeve. 
Yeah, very interesting. Amanda Krizovich, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. The ruling in the NFL Sunday ticket case has been appealed by the plaintiffs who want their $4.7 billion verdict back. To review, back in June, a jury in Los Angeles ruled that the NFL had been violating antitrust laws by bundling out-of-market games instead of allowing teams to compete with each other. The jury agreed and ruled that the NFL had been overcharging for the package while it was held by DirecTV over nearly 12 years, ending in February 2023. They determined that the damages totaled $4.7 billion, which under antitrust law can lead to a penalty three times that, which would reach $14 billion. The judge, however, completely disagreed with the jury, saying they relied on guesswork and speculation. He tossed out the penalty and the requirement that the league cut the current Sunday ticket price of $4.49 per year on YouTube TV. Plaintiffs are the Ninth Circuit to overturn the entirety of the judge's ruling. What's at stake here is a major pillar of the NFL's practice of nationalizing its media revenue and distributing it equally. The question of whether it can continue to do so could make it to the Supreme Court. The LSU-USC game didn't just outdraw the Super Bowl, bringing nearly 64,000 fans to Allegiant Stadium. It saw 9.2 million people tune in on ABC, making it the network's third best Sunday college football opener. That's despite 11 million people not having access to the game due to Disney's ongoing carriage dispute with DirecTV. The network also notched impressive audiences for Notre Dame's victory over Texas A&M, which 8.2 million people saw, and Georgia's blowout of Clemson, which drew 7.9 million viewers. Disney has to be pleased with the first weekend of its 10-year, $3 billion deal with the SEC. Roger Federer wants to be more than a shoe salesman. While his sneaker company On continues to make headway in that market, Federer is still deeply involved in the sport he dominated for a decade, including new initiatives around the Laver Cup, which, not coincidentally, is chaired by his agent, Tony Godsick. Front office sports editor-in-chief Dan Roberts sat down with Godsick to discuss his and Federer's vision for tennis, and that conversation is next. Okay, Dan Roberts here in the FOS studio in New York, and I've got Tony Godsick, tennis agent with Team 8, as we head into the Laver Cup right around the corner in Berlin. Tony, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So let's just start this way. We're going to talk about the Laver Cup. It's coming up. But let's kind of rewind. You have been Roger Federer's agent. Uh, you have had quite a ride with Federer. Obviously, also there's Del Potro and other clients. But talk to me about how that relationship has evolved over the years. I mean, we'll talk about the Laver Cup, which you guys co-created but managing the business of Roger Federer. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm a big fan, so this is, uh, this is fun for me to do. Um, I got very lucky. Actually, uh, next year it'll be 20 years uh, since I first met Roger. Uh, he had just um, won the US Open 2005 against Andre Agassi, and Ted Forsman and uh, one of my other clients, Monica Sellis at the time, uh, told me, hey, we've got a new client coming back to IMG and you're going to be the agent. So I actually really didn't do much to, to sign him. And so after he beat Andre, we started to work together and um, it seems like yesterday. I mean, it's been an incredible ride. I mean, he, you know, for the first, you know, four or five years, he was in the final of like every Grand Slam. So it was kind of, uh, you know, I had something really cool to sell, but he had like a white canvas at that time. So we were really able to sort of uh, create a brand strategy um, tennis provides you the opportunity to have, a, it's a global sport, so we said let's go find some, some global brands and uh, we were off to the races. And he's so wonderful and he participates so much in his business that it was really easy to partner with him and, and do really fun things. Um, you know, he over delivers all the time. So I never have to worry about the babysitting, you know, showing up on time, getting in trouble. You know, um, when he's in a room, you can tell he's actually happy to be there. You don't, on his face, some athletes, you say, oh, well, you can tell yeah. when the clock, you know, hits midnight, they want out. Um, Roger really is, a, is an interesting person. He loves people. So, um, yeah, so we were just off to the races, and um, it was fun. I mean, people say, oh, he's retired now. You, you must be retiring. I said, well, when he played, he had excuses, which is I'm practicing and I'm playing. Now he's not practicing and he's not playing, so we have a lot more time for, for business um, you know, partnerships and different investments we've made. And the Labor Cup obviously was uh, something that we uh, created together back in 2015, 16. And to see it, you know, we're gonna be, it's our seventh year coming up here in Berlin in a few weeks, uh, it's amazing. But um, it's been a lot of fun. He is really one of a kind. So let's talk about the Labor Cup. First year without Federer playing, 
Uh, this, will be, uh, this will be, he retired in 22. So the third, uh, this will be the second edition. Second. Vancouver okay, okay. and now Berlin. Yeah. Got it. So, you know, how did that change things in terms of uh, which players you emphasize? You've still got uh, a number of the top 20 ranked in the world playing yep. this year, which is great. You know, I see Ben Shelton is, is going to be there and uh, you still have Rafa and a number of the biggest names. But obviously, I imagine Roger goes. Yep. And does he now kind of transition to becoming a, almost like an ambassador? Sure. So he's a, a co-founder and a creator of the event. Um, it's not the Federer Cup, it's the Labor Cup. Um, one of the really nice things when we got started with the Labor Cup, we needed sponsors. And we obviously needed blue chip amazing sponsors. And Roger had a portfolio of blue chip amazing sponsors. And so um, Rolex is our founding sponsor. And uh, we have UBS there as well and Mercedes. And these are his brands. Um, On um, is, is a sponsor and Uniqlo. So he's there actually quite busy. You know, and I always tell uh, sponsors, he's actually probably more valuable now mm. that he's not playing because he actually has time to spend with their customers and uh, do interviews and, um, you know, welcome the players and things like that. So it's definitely changed. Um, we always called the Roger the ticket magnet. Literally, we would put tickets on sale. We wouldn't spend any money on advertising or marketing, and the tickets would sell out within like an hour. Um, now it's, it's a bit different. Um, we're still been sold out and stuff, but we actually have to get creative. And they're big stars now. I mean, as you mentioned, Rafa's playing. Carlos Alcaraz is playing yep. for the first time. Taylor Fritz. Uh, Taylor Fritz is playing. Um, ben Shelton, who's, you know, uh, is arguably going to be next, one of the next biggest stars here in the U.S. So, yeah. He's playing. Francis Tiafo is playing. He's still in the U.S. Open. So we have, a, you know, a plethora of, of big stars. So it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But he, it's different now. But he comes for the whole week. He really enjoys it. I think he's, he's super proud of it. Um, he wanted to create, you know, he felt like, A, we've got to do something for Rod Labor. This guy, you know, basically took off a whole chunk of time to usher in the professional game. The guys are going to be out there and the women are going to be playing for three point something million dollars. Rod, you know, barely made that in his entire career. Right. Um, and he won two, you know, calendar year Grand Slams. And so Roger wanted to create a, there was no event where the past stars of tennis came back collectively and could interact with current stars and future stars. And that's sort of what the Labor Cup is all about. And so Roger also sort of geeks out at the fact that, you know, Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe are the captains. He loves spending time with those guys. Obviously, Rod Laver's there too, and he's such a legend. Um, and then you've got some of the biggest stars in the game with Nadal and others. So it's really, it's amazing. When you talk about you know captains and it rotates uh, city every year, this year it's in Berlin, uh, obvious parallels to the Ryder Cup in yep. golf. Uh, talk to me a little bit about trying to make it, if it's fair to say, the Ryder Cup of tennis and the thinking also with it being Team Europe versus Team Rest of World, which is kind of interesting there, yep. that it's not, it's, you know, golf is just US and, and Europe or UK. Yep. No, so <clears throat> look, um, we would, you know, we love when we're compared to the Ryder Cup. I mean, they're, they've got a hundred year start on us. So we are a historical event with very little history. So we're actually <laughs> trying to, to, to build the history. Um, you know, I think one of the, you saw it this summer, well, you see it every Olympics with basketball, but you saw it really with the Avengers this year with the big team. When you get rivals to become teammates for a short period of time, it's, it's magical. And that's, I think, what we've uh, created here. You know, it's not, uh, you know, these, th some of the doubles combinations, a lot of people who play tennis really just play doubles. Right. But you never see the big stars playing together. And so this is an opportunity where we, we showcase the best of men's tennis in unique formats. Rivals become teammates. Um, and the te team competition matters. Hmm. You know, people, when we started, were like, well, you think the guys are going to try hard. I said, are you crazy? I mean, this was Roger's point, too. The peer pressure is amazing. You've got Macron and Borg sitting on the court coaching you. You've got the greats like Rod Laver watching. You've got your other sort of um, competitors watching too. So um, these guys try really hard and, and it's amazing. And I just think the unique, it's not all year long. This is just one weekend and the players uh, seem to like it. And the fact that we rotate this around the world is really interesting. You know, we, we hit some of the cities that don't normally see a lot of tennis, or, you know, we've been to some cities that actually do see a lot of tennis and just love it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been great. But we love the comparison. I mean, you see the Ryder Cup's been so um, successful, and people sort of, um, they get so geared up to, to watch these combinations. And then the optics, the content that's mm -hmm. created, seeing these superstars on the same team, 
coaching one another, giving each other tips, um, I think is great. And there's, I mean, the uniforms matter too. You know, I think you, you see these guys all wearing different things and the fact that these guys, I mean, the Labor Cup, we've got Team World is in red and Team Europe's in blue and, you know, they're wearing their brands, which obviously was very important. We mm. wanted each player to be able to wear their brands, but the uniform look, I think uh, every once in a while is, is wonderful. I wanted to ask you, uh, especially when we talk about managing Federer, about brands on the court and apparel. You know, for so many years he had the Nike deal and the RF logo, then went to Uniqlo, which I remember covering at the time, and it was kind of amazing to sign a new apparel endorsement deal that late in his career. And now, of course, in the last few years, working with On, and you know, I know On as a running brand, but On getting into tennis shoes. Um, talk to me about kind of managing those deals and also uh, even now, now that he's retired, how that works with you know, using him as an ambassador and, as you said, in some ways maybe even more valuable now. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Roger spent, I think, over 24 years with Nike. It was amazing. They helped make him a huge star. Um, the contract was coming to an end. You know, what do you do with a 36-year-old, soon-to-be-retired athlete? I tried to convince them that you can do a lot. Um, they have so many different superstars. They do an amazing job. Um, and so, you know, we went out and looked for, for another deal. And because Roger actually has such a passion for fashion, um, it wasn't something that I fabricated. I mean, he'd always, you know, he's very close with Anna Wintour, him, mm. he and his wife Mirka, and they've been to fashion shows, and he genuinely really likes fashion. So when we were able to, uh, when I was able to go to Japan and meet, meet Mr. Yanai and learn more about yeah. Uniqlo and fast retailing, it became very clear that uh, actually one of their top executives, John Jay, had a great quote. He said, look, Roger might retire from tennis, but he won't retire from life. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting because they're all about life wear. And yes, they are in tennis, but they're also about fashion. And, and so it, it was a, a great fit. And, um, and so anyway, um, Nike decided, uh, you know, they didn't want to match, which was totally fine, and we were on our way. And they, you know, fast retailing, Uniqlo, they don't make shoes and right. sneakers. So in the beginning, Roger wore um, the sneakers. And I had gotten to know the On guys because I had invested with them a few years before. And so I just got to know the guys, and they would always ask me, do you think it's ever possible we can do something with Roger? And I've said, no, he's with Nike. He'll be with Nike forever. Mm. And so sure enough, in 2018, when he uh, moved to Uniqlo, there became an opportunity. And at that point, I'd already gotten to know the founders, and they were, you know, they started in 2011, I think, but they were, they were on their way. And um, every time I went to Zurich, I'd go speak to them. And um, I just, I, I saw they were building something unique. And then I started seeing all these shoes everywhere. Everywhere. And, um, and they believed, funny enough, um, they believed in tennis. They said, look, this is an interesting platform. We believe in it. Where, you know, some of the other brands, they don't focus as much on tennis. Some of the big brands out there have had some of the biggest superstars and maybe don't utilize them as much. Um, on really felt like, wow, there's something here with tennis. And so because a combination of Roger being injured, um, he had this uh, knee surgery plus COVID, he actually was home for a lot. And their headquarters are in Zurich. And so Roger could spend a lot of time with their uh, designers, their developers, with uh, Olivier Bernard, who's the original founder, coming up with a shoe. And I think they, I mean, they went through at least 10 different iterations of the shoe. And then when he was able to come back um, in Doha, he, mm -hmm. he wore the shoe. Awesome. And so, and it's been great. Um, you know, and Uniqlo and, and On work really closely together. And, um, but they're two completely different brands. Um, they're both super global. And it's been fun. And, you know, when you're at one of the bigger brands, you're one of many. And especially with some of the, the real big brands like Nike, they've got so many superstars. Whereas Roger went to Uniqlo and he was a superstar there and they really focused on growing his brand. And then On was just starting and starting in tennis. and Until they signed Zendaya. Now. Until they signed yeah. Zendaya, which was great because yeah. that was a part of the market they wanted to, to go after. And I would argue there's no bigger superstar in Hollywood at the moment, um, then Zendaya, and then she was in this the Challengers movie, mm -hmm. which was great for tennis. She Perfect was showing fit. up at tennis, yeah. so it really was great. And this was all their idea. I mean, these guys really have an incredible vision at on, and you know. But ultimately, where they're doing so well is they understand that their core business is the runner, and the athlete. You know, and so people are like, oh, what's the next superstar movie star they're going to sign? And I'm like. I think they're also going to focus on yeah. making sure you know uh, people win marathons, and they've got this new light spray technology that they just came up with. So it's been it's been a lot of fun, and it's been like a breath of fresh air. It's like a, a new career for Roger. Yeah, um, that's really so. cool. Good obvious fit. Uh, it's funny you know mentioning Zendaya and the movie Challengers. 
uh, it's kind of a, a natural segue. It, it feels to me like there's more momentum in the last couple of years with tennis in America because now we once again have some big American stars. We've had more Americans, you know, hang around in this U.S. Open than in past years. Uh, on the women's side, there, there's Pagula. On the men's side, there's, you know, Big Foe and, and Ben Shelton. They had that incredible, uh, really close battle, Tiafo and Shelton did. Mm -hmm. And you've got these guys at the Labor Cup. Yep. Um, so let's kind of zoom out and talk about just state of the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what excites you when you look at the, the young stars today, having been, you know, 20 years in and around this business? And, um, you know, f feels like uh, things are in a really healthy place in, in the U.S. again for fandom. Yes. No, look. The U.S. Open has gone from strength to strength. I mean, it's it's a massive operation, and it's the, you know, it's obviously the best tennis in the world, but it's also sort of the must see, uh, must attend event in the United States. So they've done a great job. I think also when I first started in the business in the early '90s, not to date myself, when I was at IMG, in order to become super famous, you needed to make the middle weekend or the final weekend of a Grand Slam because then you were going to be on CBS or NBC or whatever it might be. Uh, now every athlete's got a channel of their own or multiple channels with TikTok and Instagram and Twitter or X um, and stuff. So they, they've got that going for them so they can sort of cultivate their brand throughout the entire year. Um, and then, you know, people uh, generally care about the content. You see there's content crews behind the scenes everywhere. It used to be taboo. The players would never allow... Um, cameras sort such, of behind such the access, scenes, yeah. such access, in the gym, leaving the locker room and all that stuff. And now the players are basically have accepted it and embrace it. And so, you know, you've got that. And then what's really nice, um, you, we were touching on it before with, with the fashion, is fashion brands love tennis. I mean, yep. they just do. Um, look at uh, Gucci's got a tennis line out right now. You've got Lululemon that's come into the sport. Obviously, Nike and Adidas. You've got On coming. They've got Ben Shelton, Iga Swiatek, the, the number one player in the world. When I go to the U.S. Open, I, I'm always struck by the polo stuff, too, the Ralph Lauren. I mean, they must make a killing. From, they they from do a great job. Weeks. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've spent some time talking to Patrice Levette, the, the CEO I've known when he was at Gillette. He was the president of Gillette when Roger was there. You know, they've got some great tennis stuff, and they've been uh, doing wonderful uh, things. I mean, they've been working with Ben Shelton with a fragrance, yeah. um, you know, launching it around the U.S. Open and, and stuff like that. So you've got, you see all these brands coming into them, and then they amplify tennis sort of outside of the grounds, which I think is really helpful. And then you've got people like Coco Golf. I mean, she's one of our clients, and I will tell you, she is she's amazing. Like, and she gets it. All her social stuff she does herself. It's all organic. She loves it. And um, you've got a bunch of stars that are, are doing that. I mean, look, Emma Navarro, great story. UVA, went to college for two years. College used to be, it wasn't the pathway for tennis, especially on the female side. If you went to college, it was kind of too late for you to make it um, as a pro. You know, Graf and Sellis and yeah. um, Sabatini and Hingis, they all 16, 17 years old were, you know, making deep runs and slams. Um, so if you went to college, it was over. Now, not only are they going to college, winning NCAAs, Emma did. Now NIL she, helps. You can NIL helps. I, you know, college. I'm not a big fan of this NIL stuff. Ah. I mean, I've seen some things in the in the last um, you know few weeks where I'm like, college sports, what's happening? It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I mean my son is a uh, he'll be a sophomore at Stanford, plays there. He's now in the ACC, you know, and uh, he's got aspirations to be a pro. I want him to have those aspirations, but he's also I've got aspirations as a father that he studies. How's that going to work? So he's done playing UNC or Virginia. A lot more Virginia. travel now, too. That's a long flight into the wind back to Atlantic you know, Coast Pacific. Conference. Yeah, uh, on the Pacific Coast. I don't know. So I think all that stuff will eventually get reset, May, certainly for the Olympic sports, um, maybe not sort of the big sports like, like football, you know, the money mm -hmm. sports. Um, but college sports, you know, there's a pathway now from college to the pro game. You see tons of people. You know, John Isner started, mm -hmm. it, he was at Georgia, and then you've got uh, Cam Norrie um, did very well. And, and so it's, I think that's very exciting, too. But there's, um, there's always going to be a new superstar. There always is. When Sampras and Agassi were leaving, everyone's like, oh, tennis is going to be dead on the men's side. And then Federer and came along. And people said about Federer and Nadal, Nadal Djokovic, when and, that era ends. And now Alcaraz is coming, and uh, Novak stayed around and is doing great still at 37 or whatever yep. it might be. Although and Alcaraz losing in the second round in, in straight sets was shocking. I think it was a shocking. It was a long summer for, for the players, you know, the Olympics and the emotion of the Olympics. The Olympics happened right after Wimbledon. I will say... <clears throat> the pressure on these athletes are bigger than ever um, because, you know, when, when a top superstar goes to a tournament, they're not just playing the tournament. So the first tournament they're playing when they go to the tournament is actually the tournament against their opponents, which is getting tougher and tougher. 
Then the big superstars have to deal with the media commitments, mm -hmm. the content we were talking about, and all that stuff. So that's a lot of pressure. And then the superstars, every champion puts pressure on themselves. So that's the third one. You're putting pressure on yourself. So you combine those three together, it's tough. And it happened. Tennis goes all year long. It never stops. And, uh, and that's what I love about the Labor Cup. I mean, going back to the Labor Cup, it's a three-day event. You know, it's not a week or two weeks. It's a three-day event. Um, and, I think, and I think that matters. You know, if you add more events to the calendar that a week, I mean, look, the slams are now, UST had a fan week. So they're sort of encroaching on a three-week event. The Masters 1000s are all 12-day events. That's sort of two days away from being a Becoming Grand like the Slam. NFL. It's a year-round news cycle. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But tennis really, especially you see it in, in the most famous female athletes in the world are always tennis players um, mm. because it's global. You think about it. Um, they're always the highest-paid athletes on the, on the women's side. You know, Serena Williams, mm. now Coco Golf. Um, back in the day, obviously, Monica Seles and um, Hingis and Kornikova and all these guys, they, tennis players. Um, but they have, they have a Super Bowl and an Olympics four times a year with the slams and then other big events in major markets. So I think that's one of the beautiful things about tennis, being so global. It's a great place to end. We could talk about this all day, but, but we'll leave it there. Tony, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Betting is here to stay in the NFL, and this season is expected to set records for the amount wagered. The American Gaming Association believes that $35 billion will be legally wagered during this NFL campaign, a new record that would exceed last year's number of $26.7 billion by nearly 30%. But who's getting the bulk of that cash? For some states, the answer is the government. New York, for example, has a 51% tax rate on all gross gaming revenues and also requires a one-time $25 million licensing fee to launch a sportsbook. Naturally, then, New York also has the highest tax revenue from gaming, around $2 billion per year. FanDuel marginally edges out DraftKings in terms of market share at 35% compared to DK's 32%. If the same trend holds true for this season, FanDuel and DraftKings could account for $23.45 billion of the total amount wagered, leaving the measly sum of $11.6 billion for the other operators to fight over. For the sportsbooks, summer break ends on Thursday. The Eagles have not endorsed a presidential candidate, but you might have thought otherwise while walking around these streets of Philadelphia. On at least six city bus stops, according to WCAU, someone put realistic-looking ads showing a cartoon Kamala Harris in Eagles gear with the tagline, Kamala, official candidate of the Philadelphia Eagles. To add to the deception, the ad also has the web address philadelphiaeagles.com slash vote at the bottom, which is a real Eagles website. The site encourages people to vote and provides information about polling locations. It does not, however, state anything about any candidates. Intersection, the company that manages that ad space, called the posters counterfeit and vandalism, and they're also trying to figure out how the culprit pulled this off. Company COO Scott Goldsmith said, quote, While our bus shelters have locks that typically prevent the installation of unauthorized copy, occasionally people find a way to unlock the ad box. Cheta Emba competed in the Tokyo Olympics on the U.S. rugby team, and now she is working to expand girls' access to the sport. This interview is presented by Gainbridge. Cheta is one of 21 total athletes and organizations that has received a Parity Week by Gainbridge grant. Each organization will host an event in November supporting girls and women through sports and or education. Gainbridge is funding a total of $150,000 in grants during Parity Week. I'm joined now by rugby player Cheta Emba. Welcome, Cheta. Hi, Owen. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. Uh, so rugby was you know, one of the sports that caught more attention in the U.S. during the Olympics. I know you, you played in Tokyo. Um, how, how have you seen this sport, sport grow in your time as a player? Um, it's been amazing, honestly. You know, I came to rugby from a multi-sport background. I was actually a collegiate soccer player and then was introduced to rugby. Um, and even at that point, the excitement was building. Um, and when I joined, it was when I joined that I realized that there was this long-standing history. So it's been really cool to watch um, that history connect with the current moment and the current excitement. Um, we definitely you know, stand on the shoulders of giants. So to see some of those initial trailblazers in frame when we, you know, brought today's, you know, TikTok fanatics and <laughs> Instagram followers and all the other women's sports fans along, 
um, was really cool to see. And how are you help working to grow rugby in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we talk about this a lot as a team, that um, it's one thing to share the love of the game just through the enjoyment, um, but it's a whole other thing to add to the excitement with the performance, right? And first things first, you know, we have the honor and privilege to represent the USA, and so we try to grow the game by producing good play on the field um, and then making sure that we speak to the people that we represent, our, uh, the people that have supported us and um, the young girls and boys um, that will follow suit. It's been really cool to see the game go from, you know, humble beginnings and, you know, longer history than I realized, but not as well known to where it is today, where like, so many universities, so many schools have a club, have the beginnings of, you know, varsity programs. Um, local clubs are popping up all over. It's truly becoming more and more popular, and it's really exciting to see and be a part of. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And what do you think is the next big step for growing rugby in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's the funding aspect, you know, making sure that players are given opportunities to go out and play the game um, for fun, play it at high levels, and to have the resources and backing to make it possible no matter you know where you are or where you're from, that accessibility is key. But I think the other aspect is just visibility. You know, the Olympics have been amazing. That's when all eyes are on so many different sports. But the reality of the matter is also that we play a regular season, we play a World Series, um, where we travel all over the, the globe and put on an amazing show, competitions with um, the top 12 to 16 nations in the world. And these are fast paced matches, weekend long tournaments. It would be, I think, really massive if we could get that into mainstream media more often. Um, we're really pumped to be on Peacock and to have people be able to follow our games, um, but how much of an impact would it be for people to be able to, you know, flick on ESPN and see a highlight from the weekend? Um, I think the more eyes that we have on rugby sevens, of course, and, and 15s, the more support and the more excitement. It's a dynamic game, um, and I think there's a place for everyone in it. So, I mean, we stand on the fact that once you see it, you're going to love it. And do you feel like the sort of the highest level rugby in the U.S. is is it kind of where it needs to be? It just you know kind of needs the audience to to grow from where it is. Or are there steps you'd like to see you know within the rugby leagues? We still want to build um, in terms of participation numbers. We want to build in terms of sponsorship and funding, um, and then of course the skill level. Um, it's rising. It's it's steadily on the rise. We have um, an elite women's league that's set to launch this year with WER, um, but it's it's a work in progress. I think we are further along than we were before, than we were when when I started playing. Um, but we still have ways to go to you know match um, and exceed the international standards um, mm -hmm. of the game. So so women's basketball and soccer are both having this huge upswing in the U.S. I'm wondering if you see rugby as, you know, somewhere in that women's sports ecosystem in this country, you know, where, where would you place it in that landscape? I think we are on the rise, but probably still not as popular as basketball or as women's soccer. I think part of the challenge is just the awareness and the introduction to the sport. So um, to your previous question, you know, one of the ways to build that is by introducing it in more areas. They're kind of hotbeds of rugby around the country, but we want it to become, you know, well-known and accessible in every community, you know, every neck of the woods. And I think as we do that, we're going to have more interest. We're going to have more participation. We're going to have more opportunities and we can, you know, sustain this fire. You were awarded a Parity Week grant from Gainbridge. What do you plan to do with the money? 
Yeah, so this grant is super exciting. Um, my plan and my goal for the money is to set up a one-day clinic to introduce um, players to the aerial aspect of the game. Full Send Aerial Academy. I want to help provide the foundational skills um, and insight as to how players can really maximize their contribution to winning the ball in the air, whether that's from kick chase, um, the way that we start off the match to receiving the ball. Um, these are key moments that we don't need to just get through, but we can actually own and control. Um, and I think they're also tied in with, you know, conversations about like mindset and, and how you can connect as a team and lead one another to be at your best for these high pressure moments. Um, and it's a great opportunity specifically as, you know, women in sports, like these habits and, and these skills um, are important on and off the pitch. So hopefully through this clinic, you know, we can have a bit of fun, but also delve into some deeper conversations and work to create opportunities for players to be at their best and, and impact the game more than they already are. Yeah, very cool. Is this a sport you feel like has sufficient funding for people who want to seriously pursue it? You know, are there financial barriers for, you know, people who can reach a higher level or, um, or, or you know, if, if you're good enough and serious enough, can, can you, you know, find that path as a rugby player? Financial barriers do exist, um, and that's something that we're working on, you know, trying to make it accessible so that players can continue to pursue their passion beyond, you know, the club level, beyond the university level. Rugby Sevens is um, really blessed in the fact that it's an Olympic sport, so we have an added layer of, um, I think, notoriety and funding to allow players to be backed by the Olympic Committee as well as USA Rugby in order to focus on the training. But hopefully through clinics like this, um, spurring the interest, spurring the support, we can establish a better funding base um, so that it's not just the select few that get to play at the highest level, but we're you know able to I think cultivate a, a stronger base um, and give more players opportunity to pursue it at an elite level, whether that's for the United States or just, you know, high level competition domestically, internationally. Mm -hmm. And is there a sort of specific big domino you'd like to see pushed over in terms of the overall growth of the sport or, or is it just, you know, a matter of, you know, more sponsorships, more, uh, I don't know, more clinics, more, just more everything. I think the biggest domino is absolutely right. The funding, um, providing these opportunities, but I think also something that's important is probably having a consistent structure and pathway that players, um, family supporters, coaches, what have you can, follow along with so that it's not just one-off opportunities um, and an amalgamation of, you know, so many different things. Rather, we're building towards the same goal, um, a shared understanding of like the outcomes that we're trying to produce, the ways that we're trying to play, and then the opportunity once we have those foundations to, you know, diversify and, and express yourself in your unique way. But I think, um, having consistency uh, will go a long way with, you know, helping players not just start, but continue and to progress and um, build on the work that they put in. Um, yeah, really appreciate getting the insight into this world. Teta Emba, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Absolutely, my pleasure. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, don't be a stranger. Say hi on social media. Also, if you head over to our FOS Today Twitter feed, you can vote in our poll over which change to the NFL you're most interested in. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.